I'm not sure if you're familiar or I'm listener not. familiar with some of the technologies like Dolly 2. I'd encourage anybody listening, go check out Dolly 2. You can, you can input a sentence and from that text, it can generate just beautiful images, whether they're art or photographs, no. or whatever you want. And that type of that type of capability would be utterly impossible without the, these deep learning techniques. Uh, there's nobody on earth who would know how to even go about programmatically writing an algorithm where you would break that down into a series of steps. But these deep these uh, deep learning neural networks um, make it trivial, and you, they can generate images in seconds. Hey, 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 everybody. My name is Ryan Atkinson, and you uh, are on the Business Cloud. We have a great episode coming up today with Ron Green, the co-founder and CTO at KungFu.ai. Excited to talk with him about AI and entrepreneurship. Uh, so, Ron, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Well, my pleasure, Ryan. I glad I got, I'm glad I got the Ron right because when you first got on, I accidentally <laughs> called you Rob. So I <laughs> double-checked to make sure that intro. <laughs> nice, nice catch, man. <laughs> Uh, my first question, you have a great background, but I want to open up with your time spent in Austin, Texas, because uh, you graduated from the University of Texas in 1992. Uh, you've been here for quite some time, and as people are listening, probably know Austin's pretty big right now. Everyone's moving here. I just moved here. Uh, so I just want to ask, like, what's changed in Austin since, like, you first attended school here, um, and how has, like, the entrepreneurial scene changed? Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's almost unrecognizable. When, when I was... Um... When I was at the University of Texas in the late 80s and early 90s, um, Austin was still barely on the, the map um, from a technology perspective. And it was, um, you know, half the size it is now, if not smaller. And so um, the University of Texas was a great, great, great place to get an education. But I honestly wasn't sure if I was going to live in Austin long term because I just felt it was too small, um, too small a city. Yeah. And, uh, uh, moved away, lived abroad um, um, for a few years, and then ended up coming back to Austin. And even in the small time I was away, which was about five or six years, Austin grew mm -hmm. massively. So when we returned in 98, um, it was almost unrecognizable from the early 90s. And since then, it's gone through a transformation like every 10 years. It's just astounding. Um, um, I feel really, really fortunate to call Austin home. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Where did you live at abroad? We lived, uh, we did, my first startup I ever did was well, one of the, like the first handful of employees at a biotech startup in Toronto when we were building high-speed DNA sequencing hardware and software, you know, in like 93, 94. Um, and um, the, the throughput back then, we, we actually had the world's record for the fastest genome sequencing. We could do 300 nucleotides that's in, in 30 minutes and now you know now it's very much on the order of like three billion in you know 10 minutes so that's how much things have changed how so what's been what's changed more austin or this uh like world record of how much you can process <laughs> oh I, I think i think how much you can process the genome you know the fact that you can have an entire entire sequence of an individual um just done in seconds with the new essay technologies is 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 a revolutionary that is cool. It has to be said, though, like your time abroad has to, I think it's always crazy when I always go abroad and I come back, I'm just like, yeah. wow, my perspective on life has changed. Like people live in such different ways. Like I can understand why people approach this problem this way, or they approach it this way. It just it really opens you up as a person. Uh, yeah. Was there a specific uh, time where that really showed when you were in Toronto living abroad, where it was like, oh my gosh, people do things way differently here? You know, honestly, not so much. We've, uh, we, we lived, uh, my wife and I, we lived in Toronto for a few years. And then I went to grad school uh, in, in England at the University of Sussex. And I think, you know, both very, very similar cultures to America, England, yep. English speaking country. So it, it really wasn't that dramatic of a, a cultural shift, honestly. But from like the people like day to day, was there something that like, from like the people, there had to been something where you was like, oh, I can take this back with me now. And this affects how I'm going to lead and how I'm really going to operate within a startup. Oh, yeah. Um, well, the, the, when I was in Toronto, the company was called Visible Genetics. We eventually went public and got acquired by uh, Bayer. But um, 
that was my first startup. I had, I had no clue. I mean, I can't even tell you how much I, I learned there. In fact, I remember one of the funniest stories was I was offered an option package and they said, let us know if you want more options. Literally just said, tell me if you want more. And I said, no, I'm good. I'm fine. Like I, I didn't even know, you know, I didn't even know what they were or how valuable they would become in time. Um, and so I, um, what was amazing about that experience of visible genetics was we were we were so bootstrapped that we were officing out of a closet no. of the hospital. It was a large closet, but it was a closet um, within the hospital of the founder um, that he was associated with. And we literally like missed payroll one time. Um, <laughs> You know, it was just touch and go for for several years. But we eventually figured out the hardware, we figured out the software, we got some traction with clients, um, and went public. And um, it I, to me, that's one of the things that I lean on all the time, which is it doesn't matter how how dark it may seem in your startup's journey. Um, really, really big successes can have. Um, you know, can go through crises like not even making payroll occasionally. And we we came out of that. We used it as um, we used it very much as sort of a, a bonding event. You know, it didn't get us down; it just made us more determined. We pulled together. We, when you, when you don't make payroll, and I think we were probably less than twenty people at that point. You either it either destroys the company, or you yeah. pull together the team and you come out stronger. Yeah, I mean, I bet there's like a beautiful camaraderie within that, where it's like, oh, like kind of a joke, kind of like, oh, like we're gonna get through this together. <laughs> but as you said, exactly. it can it can really destroy a company, but it didn't with you. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And it was amazing. We went from being, you know, literally a, a bunch of folks jammed into a large closet to having our own offices That's downtown. So cool. You know, you really can start sending, sensing the momentum. It was it just an incredible experience. And in fact, I feel like that, um, that experience was so transformative. Once I did, once I did a startup, I knew I would never do anything but startups the rest of my life. That's what I was just going to say next, instead of being like, oh, I'm going to run away from this. I don't like this. You actually leaned into startups and stayed in startups like the rest of your life, essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I think it's a couple, you know, if I was going to psychoanalyze myself, I think it's a couple things. One is I'm really bad at um, taking orders. So, you know, it's like Fair. I want to do what I want to do. And you you are. um you know, really on your own, calling your own shots within a startup more than anything I've ever experienced before. Um, but then there's also that just incredible vibe you get from starting from nothing, just a blank slate. Oh. You have an idea, you come together with some people and you create something from scratch. And you have to know going in that the odds of success are stacked against you because most startups fail. But that's that's what makes the wins even more, more exciting. Yeah, but it has yeah. to be like, why do you take that risk though? You know, the odds are so far yeah. against you. Some people are crazy enough to yeah. take it, but some people yeah. aren't. Why do you take that risk? Um, you know, I'm not totally sure. That's a great question. I think I just enjoy it so much. Um, I think it's a couple things. Um, one is I'm not joking about like, I really am not great at taking orders. I just want to do what I want to do. And I find <laughs> that I will work incredibly hard at something if it's, you know, a, a, a task I assign myself. Yeah. Um, there's also, you know, upside can just be fantastic. And there's almost nothing more fun than, than creating something from scratch. But then that there's is cool. this other element, which is, you know, I was trained in computer science and I love building software and I love writing software. And when you, when you start a new software company, you can kind of, I can kind of be hands on the keyboard for a little bit. I typically yeah. get about 18 months as an individual or contributor before the company becomes too big, think the processes are too complicated. Um, and then I get basically, I get my keyboard taken away from me and it's like, I have to be more of a traditional CTO. And so that hands-on experience with each startup is I think something that keeps driving me as well. Interesting. So if someone was going to consider, if I, right out of school, should I join a startup? Should I join a corporation? Uh, what advice would you give to them then? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, I think joining a startup or a corporation right out of school, either way is fine. I would probably lean more towards the corporation for somebody coming right out of school. Um, startups can be, especially startups that are um, first-time founders, they can be really messy. 
and you can pick up a lot of bad habits, a lot of bad practices. And so I think, I think going to a corporation is probably the best move, but then mm -hmm. there are a lot of people I know that have, um, you know, founded startups coming right out of school and had success. So there, there's, there's always, you know, I never want to say never. And so I'd lean towards the corporation side, but some folks are just meant for startup right out of the gate. Interesting. The bad habits thing that really sticks to me. That's a thought I haven't had before, because once you are in a startup, uh, you really are exposed to that C-suite level, like pretty well, um, where you could, right. and this is your first gig out of college. You don't know what those bad experiences are. Um, that's right. Well, let's not turn this into the bad. I mean, what are some of the good habits? What are some of yeah. the good things that uh, once you join a startup and it's happening, it's like, oh, this is awesome. These are good things. What are some of those things look like within a startup? Oh, yeah. Um, you, you, you hit on one of them already, which is when you're at a startup, uh, especially if it starts relatively small, everybody within the company understands what the mandate is. Yep. Um, you're all rowing in the same direction. Every single person on the team is critical path. So you could be 22 and just out of college and you can feel the effect you're having on the company, right? You're setting in discussions about product roadmaps or you're setting in on discussions about, um, you know, what the next raise might look like or how much capital you have left or your burn rate and all that type of stuff. And so um, from, from, from the perspective of having an impact, it's, mm -hmm. it's incomparable in that way. You, you know, you, you, you can almost on a daily basis feel the impact you're having. And that's one of the most amazing things about, in my opinion, about being involved in startups. Yeah, that's uh. so I actually like right out of school, I joined a corporation within HubSpot, a uh, 5,000 person company, ginormous. Um, yeah. And one of the reasons I wanted to leave, love HubSpot, love the people there, but I was like, I'm not making an impact. You're like, yeah, like I'm setting meetings, really fun. Like, like this might happen, but I want to join a startup culture where every day, like, I can see like my work being published and be like, wow, this is actually making an impact. Um, yeah. I think some people, they don't realize that when they join a startup or that they're really going to have impact. And that's why some people do, but some people don't expect that. Like, oh my God, what I do, I have to be good because it, and it impacts the whole company. That's right. And, and, and the, the converse is also true, which is um, we, I'm always very leery of people who have been in corporations pretty much throughout their entire career joining mm. a startup because the the dynamics are so different. Um, um, within startups, there is the the momentum is is entirely sort of um, driven from inside. And in large corporations, there is a momentum all on its own. And you have very frequently, you know, the war chest from a capital perspective and name recognition in the startups you know, you're just trying to get people to respond to emails and answer phone calls in the beginning when people have never heard of you. And so it's, it's just such a radical mind shift. If you stay in the corporation world too long, it can be really difficult to adjust to a startup mindset. Yeah, that's uh, that's a, like another thing that comes from HubSpot. It's like, I see them posting all the time on social media. And it's like, well, they have this brand name, like all their likes, all their posts are getting like 500 likes. And it's like, well, they do have this brand name. And like, I'm posting right. on my start or Lumion startup. And it's like, oh, like we're not seeing the same success, but it's like, we just don't have that brand recognition yet. Um, one thing that I am curious, uh, you're a mentor at Capital Factory. Um, you've worked in startups for so, so long. Can you give us like what are like the top three traits you see from executives where it's like they have their stuff figured out and this is a startup I can get behind? Mm, mm, that's a great question. Um, I would I'll, I'll almost will flip that on some head briefly to kind of tee up the answer. Probably the number one mistake I see is people without a technical background who have an idea and they will put their life savings into the development of an application that is outsourced in some way. And then when they're out of money, um, there's, there's no way to move forward. And so one of the things that I, you know, counsel the most frequently is, you know, if you're not a technical person, get a technical co-founder and maintain ownership. That's, you know, that's, <laughs> that is one of the biggest mistakes I see. And so the people that really are, um, I think best suited for success, ironically, are people who have done it before. Even if you have failure, even if you've done two or three startups before and they've been failures, 
those people are so much better situated to succeed. And, um, you know, uh, startups almost never fail because of technology. It's always about product market fit, almost always in the end. And so the people that come in know the space. They can talk mm -hmm. deeply about what the competitive landscape looks like in their domain, and they understand where the gaps are and where their opportunities are, and they can um, go really deep on that and be not only qualitative, but quantitative. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that you can tell are teed up for success because too many people think the key to a startup is the idea. You uh, know, if I just have a good idea, I'll be successful. Ideas are, are almost worthless in my opinion. Everything's about execution. A good idea mm -hmm. without execution is worthless. And a, and, a, and a mediocre idea with awesome execution can be worth billions. Ah, I love that. Um, I want to talk about execution because I think execution is like one of like the most important, like in my life, that's what I really focus on is like, I'm going to take daily action and execute on what I'm going to do. Um, can you talk to us what happens at an execution standpoint within a startup? What are you looking to execute on from a day to day basis um, from your perspective as a co-founder and CTO? Yeah. Um... Well, my background is principally in the product space. So most of my, mm -hmm. most of my startup experience was within the, the product realm. Yeah. Kung Fu AI is a services company. And so yeah. it, they're, they're, really, they're really radically different beasts. And so um, on, on the product side, you really have to be focused on that, that product market fit like I talked about. Um, with, at Kung Fu AI, one, I'm just, I'm having, I'm, I'm literally having more fun right now than I've ever had in my entire life. Awesome. We have the luxury of basically spending all, all of our time building state-of-the-art AI systems for our, our clients. And that is a really, really different, um, uh, different set of demands and constraints on how you operate. We have to be, our clients are looking at us to guide their strategy, Mm. Uh, together AI roadmaps to be able to speak to feasibility on the execution on some initiative to you know, weigh them off and say it's not worth your money or there are simpler approaches and then to also vet on um, you know what's the total cost of ownership associated with some of these these very large complex AI systems and that whole domain I'm just I'm just I, I can't exaggerate how much fun I'm having there because that whole main domain is is just so different than the product world um, because it's really all about um, being um, valuable to your customers from an intellectual perspective and, and know-how and not so much about differentiating on the product space. That's really interesting. Um, when people do come to you for like professional services for Kung Fu AI uh, and they're wanting to develop all these AI tools, I mean, what's one misconception people will like always have about AI when they're trying to deploy something? Maybe not always, but... Yeah, you, you know, it's it's really funny. Um, I thought we would have a lot of clients come to us and say, you know, potentially um, ask us to do silly things like, you know, build a time machine, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> just, you know, just, you know, just, you know, um, just things really out of scope. Yeah, it's shocking to me, I'd say almost without exception, our clients come to us, and they have a even if they have no technical background, they have a pretty good sense of what's feasible. And they'll typically ask, you know, we're trying to accomplish some objective. Would this be, would this be possible? And yeah. they're almost, they're almost, if anything, usually underestimating what is possible because things are moving so quickly. And so um, we're, we're working on a project right now where the state of the art moves so substantially that if that if the client had asked us to work on this project nine months ago, we just said it wasn't feasible. No and way. Now, um, and I, it's amazing. And now we're saying not only is it feasible, but um, we think we will be able to save them um, tens of millions of dollars a year within the first year of deployments. And so, I mean, it is just hard to exaggerate how fast things are moving in AI right now. That's what I was going to ask. Like what has changed in the past nine months um, to make this actually feasible? Yeah. Um, the, the big movement in AI, you know, I've been working in AI now. It's been, it's 30 years this, oh, this year. Um, and 
you know, for the longest time, for decades, it was just, it was the promise. It was, you know, we were right, you know, right around the corner. We're going to finally figure this out. What we didn't realize in the 90s was, even though we were on the right track from sort of a technology perspective, we were, um, we, we had a massive de deficit of data. And yeah. the explosion in availability of digital data sets is half the equation. And the other half is to compute the, the you know, orders of magnitude increase in compute um, married with the data made all the difference. We were, at, it's a shocking, we were fundamentally on the right track um, yeah. as of the late 80s indeed. And so what's, happen what's happening now is we're getting increasing returns on a specific type of AI called deep learning, which are these yep. very large deep neural networks. And um, the main task using supervised learning where you essentially build a model and by showing it examples, it makes a prediction and you correct its prediction based on what it should have done. Those models now are um, able to do most perceptive tasks very near or above human capability, whether it's speech to text or language understanding or uh, textual summarization. And, and then totally beyond that, we have things that are um, utterly impossible for any humans to do. Like, you know, taking, um, you look at like some of the generative stuff being done in text to image. I'm not sure if you're familiar or I'm listener not. familiar with some of the technologies like Dolly 2. I'd encourage anybody listening, go check out Dolly 2. You can oh. literally input, yeah, Dolly, like D-A-L-L-E, okay. number two. You can, you can input a sentence and from that text, it can generate just beautiful images, whether they're art or photographs, oh. whatever you want. And that type of that type of capability would be utterly impossible without the, these deep learning techniques. Uh, there's nobody on earth who would know how to even go about programmatically writing an algorithm where you would break that down into a series of steps. But these deep these uh, deep learning neural networks um, make it trivial, and you, they can generate images in seconds. That's nuts. It's crazy to see like where a just from that, just like how fast it's grown. I mean, in five yeah. years, where would you anticipate AI? Like, what is it gonna be able to do in like five years? Mm, pro you know, n probably more than I expect. If you'd asked almost anybody with an AI, yeah. uh, sticking with like the generative stuff I, I was just mentioning, for example, yeah. like Dolly 2, five years ago, I don't think there's anybody that would really have expected us to be able to generate this level of image quality from pure text within yeah. 2022. So I would imagine within the next five years, it, the obvious next step is, you know, things like movies. You'll you'll put in, you'll put in a prompt about what you would like to see a short movie about from a high level plot perspective, and it will be able to generate that. So um, I, I'm, I have high certainty that we'll have, uh, you know, above human level capabilities for on speech recognition, speak recognition, uh, language translation, uh, you know, um, text um, um, generation. I mean, just on and on. It's it, it would take too long to enumerate all the things that are, are going to be possible here shortly. Uh, yeah, I was reading a book. It's called A Deep Medicine by Eric Tapool. Don't know if I said his last name right. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with him in this space. Uh, just deep AI um, in like healthcare, which I'm super passionate about. Um, and he made like, there was like some plot there that he said by like 2050, there will be a New York Times bestseller written all by AI. And there was crazy ones on there. But it's like so nuts to think like, in yeah. tw by 2050, I'm going to be reading a book that was all generated by AI. And hey, by yeah. the way, it's a New York Times bestseller. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I read something recently that really um, kind of blew my mind. Um, there was this idea of, we, we, you know, we're going to have generative music and generative novels and, you know, screenplays and all this, all this sort of stuff coming up. And there's concern about the idea that is this going to take away you know, jobs potentially from yeah. artists, and would it would it potentially um, take away the magic associated with with the creation of art? And and um, this person had this fantastically amazing perspective, and and he framed it like this. He said, "Would you rather listen to the best music that's ever been created by a human, yeah. or the best music 
that's possible of being created, right? That is a much larger set of music. And I think we're going to see that across the board. Not only are we going to see AI generated content that will be on par and supersede what we've ever um, received, you know, from even the great masters, but yeah. it's not just that it's going to be augmentative. Humans will leverage that and it will open up entire new vistas of art creation that wouldn't have been possible before. It'll, it'll be a tool and very much um, like all the previous tools we had before, it won't be the end of art. It's just going to be a new, the start of a new era of it, of yeah. opening um, the type of capabilities we'll see in art. Yeah. Uh, going to like capabilities, uh, we've talked like a few different industries like art. We just talked about healthcare and like text. Uh, I feel like right now the foundation of AI is probably maybe being built, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it's just starting out here. Oh, and some yeah. of the ceilings for in these industries is like skyscraper tall, like New York, New, like Empire State Building tall. Um, is there one industry that you're most excited for the use of AI because you think it has the great, greatest potential of impact? I, um, I'm probably most excited about its application within pure research within mm. STEM, meaning it's obviously going to do amazing things within healthcare, yeah. but um, I don't think we're too far away from having the ability for AI to do um, original exploration within yeah. domains. And so, for example, there are, there's a technology called AlphaFold that can do protein fold prediction. Once we, once we can uh, um, have these AI systems just do experiments, even if they're just virtual experiments based upon you know, its, its own predictions on how proteins will fold, we'll yeah. be able to automate experiments at orders of magnitudes beyond what we're doing now. But then, and, and that's, all, you know, that's all very exciting and that's gonna happen pretty soon. But yeah. imagine if you could just have AI systems doing original research, like discovering new fundamental laws or properties of physics or chemistry or things like that. And there is research in that area right now and they're making gains. Um, and it's, they're, actually, um, they're actually moving faster than I would have thought. And so can you imagine, you know, in the new, and it, this will happen in the pretty near future where we're gonna have the, the leading edge of science actually being forged by some of these AI systems soon. It's so nuts. So where does this even start? At? Like, where does it even start at? Like, if, like, if you don't even know what research that wants to be accomplished, how does the AI like figure out what research needs to be accomplished? Uh, that, that's a great question. I think, you know, I think um, there will be, there'll be constraints on this though. In okay, the beginning, it will be very much, you know, in the, ver in the beginning, it'll be very, like little sort of experiments or, or, or domains that they're, they're pointed in the direction to go explore, but long-term, and I think this would be, you know, when I say long term, I'm thinking more like 2050, you know, maybe yeah. you, just, you would just let these systems figure out what they wanted to explore and optimize based upon where they're seeing the best results. That's nuts. That is literally. <laughs> nuts. I yeah. think what excites me going back to uh, deep medicine is the usage of AI. This is so personal and like selfish, but like the usage of AI with like diabetics, I'm a type one diabetic and just the research that's in that book about like personalizing care based off of factors like your age, like how much sleep yeah. you got, uh, food you ate, exercise, and applying AI to someone's blood sugar and how much insulin they should take is one of, for me, selfishly, the best usage case of AI. But there are so many possibilities for AI where it's literally like, yes, the foundation is being built right now, but some of these ceilings are just incredibly high. It, it, it's, it's really true, Ryan. I'll give you one more example. One, one of our clients, um, we are just literally weeks away going to going to the FDA for non-disclosure reasons. I'll, I won't go into too much yeah. detail, but the, we are, there is a computer vision technology that we have developed that can detect a certain type of cancer um, based purely on uh, computer vision techniques. Um, and, and it's not that it's seeing cancer. It's not saying cancer is here or cancer is there. There's actually no evidence. There's no visual evidence of cancer. But the model can perform the superhuman task of identifying the visual signs of pre-cancer yeah. and, and accurately predict a person's cancer risk, a certain type of cancer, five years out in advance. And a, um, you know, a clinical radiologist would look at this and have 
no, would see no evidence that the risk was elevated. And so the, we're just at the very beginning uh, stage of those type of capabilities. Yeah, that was uh, that was another example. I keep going back to this deep medicine book. It was just so fascinating. But like they had like uh, like brain scans of like AI is able to detect it like way out into the future. And it's just it it is fascinating. It's a fascinating industry. Um, and like with that, I've got to ask. I mean, if someone does want to get into AI that maybe doesn't have a technical background, um, we can answer it. if they do have a technical background and they don't. I mean, how would you suggest they get into like the AI industry? It's so cutting edge. Who would not want to be in it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm not going to disagree with that. <laughs> I, uh, I it, AI right now is sort of at the the intersection of computer science, um, statistics, and and to a lesser extent, some of the more traditional AI approaches. Yeah. Um, deep learning is getting all of the attention right now, or most of the attention, but there are a lot of other techniques that are really, really valuable out there. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're really lucky in, in 2022, there is no shortage of online education. So there are entire, there are entire curriculums that you can view online from YouTube. You can go look at the Stanford or the MIT yeah. deep learning curriculums. You can specialize in NLP or computer vision. And if those are a little, too much to um, start with. Yeah, there are all kinds of online um, content out there that can show up your foundations on the software side and the statistical side to get you just that base level you need to go and engage with those courses. So there's really no, there's no impediment to self learning because there's all of the best content is is basically for free out there. Yeah, that's what I think. I think a lot of people have this misconception of like, oh, I can't break into AI because like I just don't know anything. But there's so many free resources online where people can go and learn machine learning or data science and maybe not break in, but have a really good chance to do it. Yeah. And, and I, I would maybe offer one more word of encouragement to anybody who's thinking about this. At Kung Fu AI, we have um, an engineering team with just crazy diverse backgrounds. We have people yeah. with you know, chemistry or neuroscience or physics or mechanical engineering backgrounds, the, the vast majority are not computer science, mm. um, you know, um, folks that that went into AI the normal way. We're, we're a collection of people who just found AI and and, and became passionate about it. And, and now that's what we do for a living. Ah, I love that. Um, so we're coming down to a conclusion here. I got two more questions, three more technically, uh, but two, we'll start with this one. Um, Everyone's entering AI. It's moving at such a rapid pace. Just to kind of say, kind of wrap up in a short, condensed form of what we said. Everyone's getting into it. It's moving at such a fast pace. Healthcare is adopting it. Art's adopting it. Um, is there some part of you, like deep down inside, where it's like, like holy smokes, like I don't even know what AI is going to be in so long, where it actually like kind of scares you about the potential <laughs> of AI? <laughs> I, I, um, if I'm being honest, I'd say yes because. Yeah. Um, I think that I think that um, I, this is not exaggeration. I, I really feel strongly that this is true. Is I think that if you went back and you look at the history of technologies over the entire span of humanity, yeah. you know, you might you might call out the wheel or yeah. fire or the you know the the printing press. I really have no doubt that. What's happening in AI right now will supersede all of those. It will be the red line in history where there will be, there was before AI and there was after AI because it's going to unlock so, so much uh, potential. But with any type of power, there's an asymmetry, right? Yep. And so as we get more and more powerful AI systems, they'll be able to be leveraged for harm Mm -hmm. um, as much as they'll be able to be leveraged for good. And there are going to be such complex emergent systems. I think it's hard to know exactly um, how they will unfold in the future or how they will manifest themselves. So there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a part of me that's a little nervous about that, but um, the upside is so enormous. We have yeah. to go explore this. We have to be, we have to be thoughtful about it and we have to be careful and cautious, but um, I think the good will massively outweigh the bad. 
That's awesome. Yeah, I was gonna ask a question about like, oh, is it good that like Meta and like Google is investing in AI, but it's really like uh, countries like that are investing in AI for like like war reasons or whatnot. But like you said, the potential, the upside is so good that we have to pursue it and continue to right. pursue. It. Right. And so last question here, you're obviously awesome. Like you're wicked smart. You're very personable. Uh, I'm curious, is there one trait, uh, going back to the personal side, is there one trait that is like, oh, if I had to really put my success on this one thing, this one trait, uh, it'd be this trait. And I think everyone else should, or not everyone else, people should consider investing in this trait a little bit more. Um, I would say just, um, just the mentality of of just a continual effort with small gains it adds up over time so you know we were talking about people breaking into ai don't feel like you have to do that in a day just learn a little bit at a time you'll wake up one day and you'll you'll have learned so much and you'll have this body of knowledge and, and now you're ready to go and the same thing on on the product side you know um incremental incremental addition to, to products is how you end up with something great. Don't, don't try to start too big. The, yeah. You know, successful big systems start off as uh, simple, small systems. And so um, I would just echo what I said earlier, you know, good ideas are, are just not that valuable. It's all about execution and execution comes down to determination and not giving up and just waking up every day and fighting the good fight. And I think that's the real um, main difference. That's great. Yeah. I like to reflect on like this podcast. I started out, I was getting like my professors and people I knew and those small compounds of small changes lead to great guests like you. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Ron. Uh, where can people find you? Where can people connect with you and learn more about you uh, and learn about AI, entrepreneurship, anything, plug it all. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, they can go to kungfu.ai. Um, we have all kinds of offerings. We do AI for good once a month. We help nonprofits. We help people break in to the field. Reach out to me at Ron, uh, just R-O-N at kungfu.ai. And then you can follow me on Twitter as well um, and, and reach out. I'm, I'm happy to chat with anybody out there that's interested in AI. Awesome. And everyone, those links will be down below. Ron, thank you so much for joining us. This was an awesome episode. Learned a ton. AI is awesome. And you are even more awesome. So thank you so much. Oh, well, Ryan, this is absolutely my, my pleasure. I appreciate it so much. Hey, 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 everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode with Ron Green of KungFu.ai. Conversations about AI are always super exciting. As someone that has worked in the industry, has read books about the industry, it's always really fun to hear how fast it's accelerating and opportunities it has to disrupt our day-to-day -day lives. If you learned something from this episode from Ron, why not drop a like on this video? We want other people to hear from it, and we want you to be able to help us with that. Also, make sure to smash that subscribe button, turn on the notification bell for all of our upcoming episodes. We have a whole list of great entrepreneurs that are coming up on the show, and we don't want you to miss out on it. And whip out that smartphone. Uh, head to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating as well. This helps with discoverability and helps that list get even longer for great podcasters to come on, great entrepreneurs. Lastly, let's binge. Check out some of our recent episodes you hear from great entrepreneurs. We would love for you to continue on your journey to becoming a great entrepreneur as well. And we'll see you on the next Business Cloud episode.